Hello, everyone. My name is George Mashur. I'm an anesthesiologist and a neuroscientist at the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the United States. I also serve as the chair of anesthesiology here. I founded the Center for Consciousness Science in 2014 and founded the Michigan Psychedelic Center in 2022. And it's really my great pleasure to contribute to this exciting academic event. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, uh, but I look forward to sharing some of my thoughts with you. And with that, I'm going to share my screen. Just give me one moment. Okay, so I'm going to talk about consciousness and the prefrontal cortex. I have no conflicts of interest to declare, but I do want to state that I have a few intellectual disclaimers. First of all, there is a lot of work on this topic. There's a lot of great work. And I'm just going to be showing you one thread, one line of investigation uh, from our group and um, some of the work of others but there's a, a lot to consider on this topic. The other disclaimer that I have is I don't really have certainty on anything. Um, I believe it's really important to approach this topic with intellectual and epistemological humility. And so I, I need to put that forward. So just a little bit about me um, and my interest, because you know when I started getting interested in consciousness, there really wasn't a field of consciousness science. Um, I first decided that I wanted to commit to the study of consciousness when I was an undergraduate in philosophy. Uh, and in particular, it was reading Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason um, that deeply connected me to this question of consciousness. But again, there wasn't a field. I was a junior in college, it was 1990. Um, and yet by the time I got to graduate school uh, in 1995, I had already done a few years of my medical school training, the field had been born as we know it today. And so just to review some of the events, and many of you are probably already familiar with this, but in the 1980s and 1990s, a number of prominent scientists publicly turn their attention to consciousness. And I'm sure you know the players in this game, Francis Crick, Gerald Edelman, Roger Penrose, uh, Nobel laureates all uh, with Dr. Penrose's uh, more recent award. Uh, and this brought a lot of legitimacy to a field that didn't have a lot of legitimacy because for the greater part of the 20th century, consciousness was really marginalized or antagonized as a subject of serious scientific inquiry. Between 1992 and 1994, the first journals on consciousness were founded. Consciousness and Cognition, the Journal of Consciousness Studies. In 1994, there was the first multidisciplinary conference on consciousness that happened in Tucson, and that continues uh, to happen. And finally, Consciousness was starting to get recognized at the highest level of science. Francis Crick and Christoph Koch published an article on consciousness, visual awareness, and B1 in Nature in May of 1995. And I remember it because I was just about to start my PhD training. And this signaled something to me that, wow, consciousness is being discussed uh, in a major journal like nature. Of course, I didn't have the historical context at the time to realize that that was a landmark event. So the science of consciousness is now flourishing, but one of the first research programs that was formally proposed and that we still grapple with is what are the neural correlates of consciousness? Now, what is that set of neuronal events and processes that can account for uh, a particular percept. Now, this was decades ago, and there have been really remarkable advances in neuroscience and neuroimaging, uh, the control 
of neural circuits. And yet, despite all these advances, we are still grappling with the question and the controversy as to whether or not the neural correlates of consciousness are in the front of the brain or in the back of the brain. And I am not exaggerating the coarseness of this dialogue. In fact, there have been articles published in the Journal of Neuroscience not too long ago, including that phrase in the title, what are the neural, are the neural correlates of consciousness in the front of the brain or in the back of the brain? And right now, the prefrontal cortex is an area of great controversy. And a lot of the different theories hinge on the role of the prefrontal cortex. For higher order thought, and I know that you've got experts that will be speaking about this, the prefrontal cortex is critical for consciousness because it generates meta representations. So a first order representation might occur in the primary sensory cortex, and then the prefrontal cortex generates a meta representation. So there's I am experiencing something in the world, for example. For integrated information theory, IIT, and I know that you're going to hear about that as well, the prefrontal cortex is not thought to be important or critically relevant. Um, it's this posterior confluence of sensory and association cortices, the so-called posterior hot zone of consciousness that is thought to be critical. And yet another possibility is global neuronal workspace theory. And I'm, I'm going to disclose that I uh, and my thinking and our, our research and our findings are most aligned with that theoretical framework. And in global neuronal workspace theory, first proposed as a psychological theory uh, global Workspace Theory by Bernard Bars in the 1980s. And then uh, there was a neuroscientific instantiation in 1998 by Stanislaw Dehaan uh, and Jean-Pierre Changeau. Global Neuronal Workspace Theory posits a critical role for the prefrontal cortex, not as the source of consciousness per se, but as a critical node that activates a reverberant network um, across, across anterior and posterior cortices. Now, although it's a confusing field with many different theories, it is important to draw some distinctions in terms of the types of consciousness uh, we might be talking about. And Ned Block, as I'm sure many of you know, made the distinction between phenomenal consciousness, purely qualitative aspects, um, of experience and access consciousness, what the brain, what the brain does with that experience. And some might be tempted to parse out these different theories based on these uh, different aspects. Global neuronal workspace theory is very explicitly about conscious access, but the differentiation between that access and phenomenal consciousness is not as wide uh, as might be hypothesized by some. There's another distinction when it comes to consciousness that's important. Um, and that is uh, the distinction between the level of consciousness and the content of consciousness, these two dimensions of consciousness. And this was proposed um, in the early to mid 2000s. Now there's a lot we could say about this. Why are there only two dimensions of consciousness? And in fact, some posit there are far more. Why are these orthogonal to one another? Is it re really meaningful to say that I can have no level of consciousness, but really rich content of consciousness? But putting that aside, I think this has been useful, heuristic, um, and I'm going to use it to uh, guide this talk. And first, we're going to focus on the content of consciousness. And one of the the First articles and um, first set of evidence uh, that was very compelling for me, actually it was the first year as a faculty member in 2007, was this study of electrophysiology and the visual modality demonstrating 
that conscious access was not associated with early processing. So up here is the, the where of consciousness and down here, the evoked potentials would be the when of consciousness, but rather with uh, this broader network level activation associated with longer latency evoked potentials. And as you can see from this diagram, um, there is not only the feed forward processing coming from V1 uh, to more anterior cortex, but there's also feedback processing. And this has many names uh, in the literature, reentrant, recurrent, reafferent, reverberant processing. I'm gonna be using the term feedback um, processing uh, for the purposes of this talk. But the, the general idea is the same, assuming in this case, a neurocognitive hierarchy, at a, a lower or more primary area, sending information to a higher order area. And that higher order area is in turn having an influence on the first order area. Now, lest you think I'm stuck in the literature of 2007, here was a more recent paper <clears throat> um, published in Science in 2018. And again, differentiating between visual conscious access now in non-human primate brain and conscious access, differentiation um, related to activity in the prefrontal cortex as a kind of ignition for this reverberant network. Now, why might this feedback reverberation be important for consciousness? Well, first of all, it is thought to sustain a representation that might otherwise dec decay. It's thought to amplify and outcompete other representations. And importantly, for the purposes of, um, or in the framework of global neuronal workspace theory, it makes representation accessible to a wide array of cognitive processors. I should also note that many theories of consciousness incorporate um, this concept of recurrence or, or feedback processing. You know, recurrent processing theory, um, that is focused more on primary uh, sensory cortex. You see these feed forward and feedback loops uh, present there. IIT also incorporates um, conceptions of uh, recurrence or, or feedback processing, uh, which I'll discuss in a moment. Global neuronal workspace theory is a, a cortex wide um, reverberation. And so I think for many of these uh, current theories of consciousness, um, it's not about whether or not recurrent processing or feedback processing is important, but really the extent to which uh, it occurs. This is uh, a graph from IIT 3.0, and I know that in preprint form, uh, 4.0 is, is now available. Um, but there's an interesting message here. You've got two model systems. The one on the right is a purely feed forward system. The one on the left is integrated and it's integrated by virtue of these feedback connections. What's important to note is that you have the same input and the same output from these two systems. And you can see immediately that in order to get the same output from the same input in a purely feed forward system, it has to be much more complicated. And we wouldn't think in evolutionary terms um, that that would be something selected for. It's too energetically and metabolically expensive compared to the more economical and parsimonious um, uh, recurrent or integrated system. And you can also see a determination of phi, which reflects the capacity for consciousness, that you have a non-zero phi value for the integrated system versus the feed forward system. Now, if these theoretical and computational arguments are not compelling, um, I'm going to turn to some empirical data 
related to anesthetic-induced unconsciousness. And this is more of my field as an anesthesiologist. And it was first demonstrated by Dr. Tony Hudetz, who is part of our center and department here at the University of Michigan, that feedback connectivity is selectively inhibited during anesthesia. So now we're looking at a rodent brain. We've discussed human, non-human, now a rodent brain. Here is the, uh, the frontal area, the occipital, the parietal. Uh, these arrows are reflecting a measure of directed functional connectivity, transfer entropy in the gamma bandwidth. And you can see during evoked uh, visual, visual evoked potentials that you have this balanced feed forward in green and feed back in red in the awake state. But when the animal is anesthetized with the inhaled anesthetic isoflurane, the stimuli are continuing on and you can see a continuation of this feed forward connected connectivity, but a selective suppression of the feedback connectivity. Now, if you increase the concentration and you turn the dial up, you're going to be suppressing connectivity in both directions. But this was quite interesting. It's also consistent with earlier work uh, in visual cortex in terms of uh, the effect of general anesthesia on feedback versus feed forward processing. When I was a junior faculty, I used this as a springboard and what I and my colleague, Unshul Li, who's a physicist who specializes in complex systems, what we did early on is to translate this to humans, uh, to EEG, uh, and to spontaneous uh, brain activity. So we first demonstrated something quite similar in terms of a selective feedback suppression uh, during propofol anesthesia in healthy volunteers. Then we extended that to surgical patients who were having anesthesia induced with either propofol or the inhaled anesthetic sevoflurane. But then this framework really helped us solve a problem uh, that had not been solved. And that was in identifying a common neural correlate of anesthetic induced unconsciousness as measured by unresponsiveness across not only drugs that are known to act on the GABA system, such as propofol and sevoflurane, but also ketamine. And ketamine is a very different drug. It's thought to have a different set of molecular targets, such as the NMDA uh, receptor or HCN1 channels. Um, metabolically, it's very different. It can maintain or enhance cerebral metabolism as opposed to propofol and sevoflurane which suppress it. At the system's neuroscience level, drugs like propofol and sevoflurane activate the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, a sleep-promoting region, and they depress arousal nuclei. Ketamine does just the opposite. It suppresses the VILPO and it activates arousal-promoting centers. Um, propofol and sevoflurane uh, tend to enhance alpha oscillations and suppress gamma oscillations. Ketamine does just the opposite. It suppresses alpha and enhances gamma. And yet, when we apply um, this framework of uh, feed forward and feedback connectivity, we find a very consistent behavior despite all of those differences. Now, let me break this down. So on the x-axis, we have time on the y-axis, a cousin of transfer entropy called normalized symbolic transfer entropy. The red tracing, again, coming from human EEG is uh, front to back or feedback connectivity. The blue is back to front or feed forward. This gray shaded area is when the drug is being administered and everything after that is general anesthesia as measured by unresponsiveness to a command. And you can see that all three of these drugs consistently suppress feedback connectivity while feed forward connectivity is relatively spared. And I wanna credit again, Dr. Unchul Lee, as well as Dr. No um, from South Korea who collaborated on this study published in anesthesiology. Now, that was 
a, a fairly coarse approach. It was low resolution EEG. It was in, in an operating room. And we only gave um, a bolus dose of ketamine, uh, rapid infusion at anesthetic levels. And some had suggested, well, maybe this already happens at sub-anesthetic levels of ketamine, um, which incidentally have um, psychedelic and analgesic and antidepressant effects. So we uh, did a more detailed study in healthy volunteers with high density EEG uh, at both sub-anesthetic and anesthetic levels of ketamine. And you can see this connectogram um, where uh, we have this feedback connectivity and you can see it reflected in these topograms here in both baseline consciousness and sub-anesthetic infusion. It's disrupted during ketamine anesthesia and it starts to recover uh, with the recovery of responsiveness. So we felt like this was a robust finding, but we wanted to understand what was underlying this. I mean, what's the mechanism? There are all sorts of um, distinct aspects um, differentiating ketamine from these other anesthetics. And we turned to network level effects. And this is a uh, human brain network representation you know, a structural scaffold that was developed based on publicly available diffusion tensor imaging. And on that scaffold was implemented, implemented a, a Kuramoto model uh, with alpha oscillations. And what we found is that structure defined uh, those dynamics. So here are the structural connections uh, between these different regions and the colors are reflecting directed phase lag index, another form of directed uh, functional connectivity. And what you can see is, is that the, the blue and the greenish, these are phase lag areas and the yellowish are phase lead. And so falling out of this structural scaffolding with a, a model of alpha oscillation you just see this natural front to back uh, directed connectivity that is dominant. Now, when we started to uncouple uh, these oscillators, much as um, you know, general anesthesia does uh, in the human brain, this is what we saw, um, which is basically all of that uh, net directional connectivity was neutralized as, as shown here with green. And that really reproduces what we saw empirically, which is, if you recall, that feedback connectivity basically converging with feed forward so that there was no net directionality. Now, in subsequent years, we um, worked in animal models. We also collaborated uh, with our colleagues at the Technical University of Munich. Um, and I spent some time there on sabbatical for the analysis of a human EEG fMRI study. Um, and also um, there were some new fMRI investigations of ketamine, all of this converging on this disruption of frontal parietal connectivity or directed connectivity during um, general anesthesia induced by diverse agents. And in 2018, this was studied more formally um, with a focus on global neuronal workspace theory uh, in um, the monkey brain, the non-human primate brain. And you can see these rich interactions that are happening on the lateral and medial surface during the awake state. But in line with our findings from 2013, ketamine, propofol, and sevoflurane all reduced um, those dynamic interactions. So if we're thinking not only about consciousness, but about anesthetic induced unconsciousness, a disruption here of this frontal parietal communication would shift the brain to a more feed forward processing system that would not be consistent um, with 
consciousness and representation um, of the world or environmental events. Now, why should this be happening? There's still a lot of unanswered questions. Is this a network level effect as, as we just described? Um, can it be uh, differentiated, this uh, feed forward and, and feedback connectivity, the, the differential susceptibility to general anesthesia, can that be a uh, receptor based? It's been argued that feed forward um, processing is mediated largely by AMPA receptors, whereas feedback is by NMDA receptors. Is this um, some sort of cortical layer specific event, uh, event? We know from recent data published in Neuron that layer five is um, globally synchronized uh, during diverse anesthetics, whereas other cortical layers are not. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but there has also been a lot of replication and I'm privy uh, to other studies that will soon be coming out um, that replicate this based on analytic techniques with independent theoretical backgrounds. Now, like everything else, the more we start probing this and thinking about it, um, the more caveats there are. And what we found in a study of both healthy volunteers and surgical patients is that the cortical connectivity that we observed pre and post anesthetic induction, if we continue to analyze long enough, it's dynamic. So yes, after induction of anesthesia, frontal parietal connectivity is disrupted, but it can also come back. Um, and it can toggle between different connectivity states. And this was based on human EEG, high density EEG in healthy volunteers. Um, and wireless whole scalp EEG in surgical patients undergoing a procedure. Now, it wouldn't be so surprising in a surgical patient that you might have variability in terms of uh, functional brain connectivity because you have varying levels of external noxious stimuli. But that's where the healthy volunteer study was key. And what we demonstrated is that during pharmacokinetically stable levels of general anesthesia without any kind of um, external perturbation, there were still structured transitions going on. And we followed up on that um, with uh, a publication uh, in Science Advances, and I want to credit Dr. Zarui Wong and also Tony Huditz uh, for leading this, uh, demonstrating that there's not simply a static disruption of connectivity patterns, but that the dynamics of the conscious state in each one of these circles represents a functional brain network. The arrows reflect transition probabilities. You're, you're not disrupting uh, all connectivity. You're shifting to a different dynamic with propofol and ketamine. And whereas these two drugs look very different, something that is common to them is the relative exclusion of the default, default mode network and dorsal attention network during the anesthetized state it becomes relatively inaccessible, uh, not in the spatial circuit sense, but in the temporal circuit of these dynamic structured transitions. So to summarize this portion of the talk, evidence does support a broad cortical network engagement and conscious experience, which includes the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex is functionally disconnected during anesthesia with selective suppression of feedback connectivity. And finally, consciousness and anesthesia are dynamic processes with structured network transitions. And I think we have to be um, cautious um, in making any claims about um, trivial or static um, disruptions and functional connectivity. For more information uh, on the global neuronal workspace theory, obviously, Dr. Dahan and Dr. Shanju have decades of really remarkable work. I had the great privilege of working with them to synthesize some of that work, um, both with respect to consciousness and unconsciousness uh, in this article in Neuron in 2020. For a broader view of multiple theories, um, uh, there have been uh, some more recent articles uh, that have been published. Okay, 
we talked a bit about the content of consciousness and the importance of this reverberant activity to sustain and make accessible these representations. But this gets to the hard problem, of the so-called hard, hard problem of consciousness um, in terms of how do we explain um, that qualitative aspect of experience. And of course, it's so difficult to study. And some of these uh, concerns have been raised in the context of global neuronal workspace theory, which is you're not looking at the neural correlates of phenomenal consciousness, but rather uh, a report, conscious access, which might engage a much broader um, uh, set of brain structures. And that has been mitigated by some recent work suggesting that prefrontal cortical neurons encode uh, content of consciousness independently of reporting paradigms, but it's still very difficult. But let's move to the level of consciousness. And in this regard, we're on firmer ground epistemologically because we're making objective determinations of wakeful behavior. We don't really need to get into subjectivity when it comes to the level of consciousness. And when it comes to the level of consciousness, I think uh, that there's a, a fairly strong argument for the role of the prefrontal cortex because it's reciprocally connected to a lot of critical arousal promoting regions. And some of them are depicted here, such as the dorsal raphe, uh, the locus ceruleus, the cholinergic system of the basal forebrain, the dopaminergic ventral tegmental area, the thalamus, of course, the pontine reticular formation, other areas that are gonna be important for arousal. And it makes sense if you think about it. If you believe that there is a neurocognitive hierarchy, and that the prefrontal cortex is at the apex of that hierarchy, then it cannot be subject to the vagaries of subcortical sleep-wake nuclei. It has to be able to exert some control. And so this makes sense. And we wanted to, as we say in the US, put our money where our mouth is and, and make a direct comparison of the prefrontal cortex and posterior parietal areas, stimulating these areas to try to reverse um, a clinically relevant general anesthetic, a, a state of unconsciousness. So we had animals that had uh, intracranial EEG and microdialysis catheters, either in the prefrontal cortex or different areas of the parietal cortex. And there's something important that I want to point out here before I move on. In fact, I'm gonna move back here. Whereas a lot of discussions of the content of consciousness have involved the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, when it comes to the level of consciousness and this kind of connectivity, we're thinking more about medial prefrontal cortex. So, we expose these animals to clinic, these rats to clinically relevant concentrations of a commonly used inhale anesthetic, sevoflurane, and then delivered reverse dialyzed either carbacol or norepinephrine, noradrenaline, as it's depicted here, either in the medial prefrontal cortex or a sensory or an association area of posterior cortex. We observed the behavior, the anesthetic was discontinued, uh, and then the animals recovered. And this is what the experimental uh, setup looks like with the, uh, the rat in an airtight chamber, and we have the EEG and EMG recording. We're, um, you know, dialyzing uh, ringers or carbacol or norepinephrine, and then we're also measuring acetylcholine. And I'm going to show you a video and you can see the animals. They're anesthetized with sevoflurane. These are the frontal EEGs and uh, tracings in blue, um, the parietal in green. Uh, we're just focused on carbacol here, a mixed cholinergic agonist. This one's going in the prefrontal cortex. This is going in the posterior parietal cortex. And the first thing that you can see um, in this tracing is EEG activation. Uh, so we're going from a higher amplitude, lower frequency tracing here to a lower amplitude, higher frequency tracing. 
Um, you can also see a little epileptiform discharge in the, in the parietal cortex in, in this instance. Um, now let's jump ahead a bit. So how do we know an animal is conscious or unconscious when it comes to anesthesia? We look at the writing reflex. Animals don't like to be on their, their back. They write themselves to get on all fours when they're awake. And when they lose that uh, reflex, we deem them to be under general anesthesia. And the concentrations at which that happens are um, well conserved uh, across species uh, where we can better evaluate um, lack of consciousness. Now you can see the animal that has had the prefrontal cortical stimulation is starting to wake up, starting to turn over. Um, and just jumping ahead, this animal actually does cover the writing reflex. Whereas uh, the animal that's had the carbocal, despite the fact that the EEG is active, and that's really interesting, um, does not appear um, to be engaging in any kind of wakeful behavior. Now, again, I cannot speak to qualitative aspects of the experience. Maybe uh, the animal in, um, in, in a state with carbocal in the parietal cortex has vivid phenomenology, and this uh, animal that's moving around is a zombie rat that has um, you know, no content to consciousness. But based on observable behavior, this animal and this one is not. Also note um, that we studied this in sleep and demonstrated that cholinergic agonists in the prefrontal cortex was delivered during non-REM sleep, as determined by EEG, promotes wakefulness. And you can see the latency um, to the wake state um, between saline and carbocal or saline and nicotine um, is. Uh, reduced, and the latency to rapid eye movement sleep is increased. So this is more or less specific in driving the animal toward uh, wakefulness. And as I mentioned before, we were measuring acetylcholine. And what we found after stimulation of the prefrontal cortex, the cortical acetylcholine levels drop with sevoflurane. You can't appreciate how much here because the scale, but you'll You'll see that um, as I move forward. Once carbocal uh, was dialyzed in, there was about a five to 600% increase in cortical acetylcholine that persisted during recovery. By contrast, this did not occur when carbocal was being delivered to parietal association cortex. Now you can see the drop in cortical acetylcholine, which is something that we and others have demonstrated in the past, this is expected, but it remains suppressed for the most part uh, during the carbocal infusion and then starts to recover with wakefulness. And based on this, there are individuals um, who, uh, including Hakwan Lau, um, who wrote an editorial suggesting that the cortical acetylcholine was a mechanism uh, for the effects of this prefrontal mediated arousal state. Now, they were describing a mesocircuit uh, hypothesis, but I think we can just focus on this tripartite circuitry of the basal forebrain, the frontal cortex, and the parietal cortex. And what you see is that you know, the frontal cortex has direct connections here to the basal forebrain that the parietal cortex does not. And so we hypothesize that there was a cortical subcortical circuit uh, that was at play. Now, I want to note that carbocal is not a cholinesterase inhibitor, so we're not expecting it to increase acetylcholine. It's a cholinergic receptor agonist. And so what we thought is that, um, you know, stimulating the prefrontal cortex um, led to, let's say, glutamatergic activation of the basal forebrain, and the basal forebrain is the primary source for acetylcholine in the cortex. And um, this projects both to the prefrontal and the parietal cortex. Now, this was in line with our thinking in terms, in terms of uh, not a cortical-cortical uh, process as, as we might expect uh, thinking about content of consciousness, but a, co a cortical-subcortical circuit. And what we had also demonstrated in a separate article in Journal of Neuroscience, is consistent with a hypothesis put forward uh, in 2017, uh, is that there was no restoration of cortical-cortical connectivity 
in association with wakefulness. And you can see these different conditions, uh, the prefrontal carbocal where they actually woke up, parietal carbocal where they didn't, prefrontal norepinephrine, parietal norepinephrine, neither were awake. But you can see that the gamma um, coherence in this example, but there are others that we, we demonstrated, gets depressed during sevoflurane, stays depressed despite the animal waking up and then increases with recovery. So it tracks with the presence of drug in the brain. So based on this and, and based on this other theoretical framework, we believe that there was a, a cortical subcortical process going on. And we wanted to see if those cholinergic neurons in the basal forebrain were in part responsible for that arousal promoting uh, effect. And so what we did is to chemogenetically drive cholinergic neurons uh, in the basal forebrain. And what you're looking at here um, are the, the results of, of the arousal. And this arousal score, I'll show you what it is in a moment, but five is recovery of writing reflex, zero is consistent with general anesthesia. And activating these basal forebrain neurons leads to an arousal phenotype behaviorally and also with the EEG, which you can see here. Uh, and again, zero is the complete absence of spontaneous behavioral arousal, moving to movements, isolated body movements, coordinated attempts at regaining writing reflex, and then the return of the writing reflex. So we've demonstrated that the prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, when stimulated can reverse the anesthetized state and um, that the basal forebrain might be the reason it's doing so. The prefrontal cortex activating uh, cholinergic and possibly GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in the basal forebrain. GABAergic neurons in the basal forebrain are actually arousal promoting. And then, um, you know, releasing acetylcholine across the cortex. So the prefrontal cortex can lead to the activation of the basal forebrain. The basal forebrain seems to be sufficient, but does it also require the prefrontal cortex in order to have that arousal effect? Is, is the prefrontal cortex not only a port of entry, if you will, but an effector arm of that arousal response? So in order to test that, we stimulated the basal forebrain, except this was electrical stimulation. And then we pharmacolo pharmacologically lesioned the prefrontal cortex with uh, tetrodotoxin, a sodium channel blocker. And so remember this arousal score, zero consistent with general anesthesia, five regaining the writing reflex. And what we demonstrated as expected when we electrically stimulate the basal forebrain, we're reversing uh, traits of the anesthetized state. But when the prefrontal cortex is lesioned, that um, effect is mitigated. Now, there still is some arousal phenotype uh, to be sure, but you can see the clear effect suggesting that the basal forebrain is having its impact on arousal in part through the medial prefrontal cortex. We did a third stimulation session just to ensure uh, that we didn't structurally uh, damage the circuitry um, during the, uh, the TTX infusion. And as you can see, this is consistent with that uh, initial stimulation result. And I wanna acknowledge some of our graduate students, John Dean and Michael Brito, who were involved in the studies published in Current Biology, Journal of Neuroscience, uh, and also one of our anesthesiology journals, Anesthesia and Analgesia. Okay, so we've gotten a hold on some of the basics of the circuitry, and I want to acknowledge uh, that there are more sophisticated ways for manipulating these circuits. Uh, these are techniques that we will need to explore, um, but certainly a proof of principle uh, that the prefrontal cortex appears to be uh, a driver for arousal. Um, we just showed, I just showed you studies that we conducted um, involving uh, the stimulation of the basal forebrain, but what about just spontaneous uh, recovery from general anesthesia? And what about the parietal cortex, which we didn't address 
with those chemogenetic experiments. So what we did in a separate study was to lesion either the medial prefrontal cortex or sensory or association cortex in the parietal cortex. We anesthetized the animals, observed the time to induction of anesthesia and recovery from anesthesia. And I'll note that in lesioning prefrontal cortex, somatosensory barrel field, and parietal association cortex all had a small but statistically significant impact on entry to the anesthetized state. But it was only the lesion of the prefrontal cortex that delayed arousal or emergence from general anesthesia, as you can see in the left here. Now, again, it's important to note, the animals still wake up. It's not like a lesion in the prefrontal cortex um, has a global effect, but um, I would posit that the prefrontal cortex might be playing a role in terms of mediating efficient recovery from an unconscious state. And I want to acknowledge Emma Pools, who is one of our graduate students who did this work. I want to now take this to humans. Um, and describe a study that we published in 2021 in eLife about what was for us an unexpected role of the prefrontal cortex during the recovery of consciousness and cognition in humans. So we had two groups, healthy volunteers uh, with EEG. We did baseline cognitive testing in both groups. One group got three hours of a deep anesthetic. The other group uh, did not. Um, we looked at recovery of consciousness, three hours of cognitive testing to follow, and then sleep-wake recordings with activity uh, for the subsequent three days. And we were surprised to find that the prefrontal cortex was engaged um, just prior to the return of consciousness. And you can see this depicted in two ways. This is permutation entropy, a surrogate uh, for cortical activity. And you can see, so this is the eyes closed baseline, loss of consciousness as they're getting indu induced maintenance phase, you know, this three hour block of deep anesthesia where everything turns blue. But you can see that just prior to the return of consciousness, um, the prefrontal area is getting hot. And in fact, it's hotter than it was at baseline, and this is not true uh, for more posterior areas. So the prefrontal cortex is coming online um, as part of this arousal process, this recovery from general anesthesia. And furthermore, contrary to our hypothesis, one of the first cognitive domains to return was abstract matching. And that is known uh, to be mediated by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So this was a big surprise for us. We had hypothesized that the prefrontal cortex would be the last uh, to come back online, not the first. But as we thought about it, we wondered whether or not the executive function of the prefrontal cortex could have played uh, a role um, that conferred a selective advantage when we think about it in evolutionary terms. So if, for example, I'm sleeping and the proverbial saber-toothed tiger is coming upon me, it's not enough for me just to have a, you know, um, a sensory perception or a fear response. I need to categorize as threatening or non-threatening. Um, I need to hold things in working memory. I need to attend. I need to dis suppress uh, distractions. I need to come up with an action plan and I need to motorically execute that action plan in order to survive this threat. And from that perspective, perhaps having um, the executive function of the prefrontal cortex engaged during arousal um, might be key for facilitating uh, efficient recovery from an unconscious state. Now, this is a speculation, um, but something that I think is interesting to pursue and consistent with some of the evidence that I've shown you in animals and humans. So to summarize this portion of the talk, <coughs> excuse me, 
cholinergic stimulation of prefrontal cortex, but not parietal cortex, can reverse traits of general anesthesia and when it comes to the PFC, also sleep. Activation of cholinergic neurons and basal forebrain is sufficient to reverse anesthesia. And, and when we electrically stimulate it, uh, the PFC appears to be required for some of that um, arousal promoting effect. Inactivation of prefrontal cortex, but not parietal cortex, delays recovery from anesthesia in rats, suggesting that is important for regulating level of consciousness. And finally, the prefrontal cortex is engaged early during recovery from anesthesia in humans, both in terms of uh, consciousness, but also cognitive function. And for further information, a synthesis of some of these ideas, uh, this was an article published last year in Trends in Neurosciences uh, with my colleague, Dr. Dinesh Powell, and also Emery Brown uh, from MIT and Harvard Medical School. Now, I want to return to this uh, slide and this framework um, just to point you to where we're going in the future. Again, there, there are lots of questions that are raised by this. Should there only be two dimensions? Uh, you know, should uh, these be orthogonal? But more fundamentally, what do these dimensions mean neurobiologically? I mean, clearly, uh, we're, we're searching for the, uh, the neurobiology of wakefulness and awareness, but is there anything in the brain that actually encodes these dimensions? And this is something uh, that my colleague, Dr. Zarui Wong, Tony Huditz, and myself set out to do uh, in an fMRI study, um, but with uh, an approach that is new for the science of consciousness, and that relates to cortical gradients. And to explain this, as I originally explained it to myself, I want to show you the state of Colorado, a wonderful state uh, uh, in the US. And if you look at this map, Colorado has very clearly defined borders. And this is analogous to thinking about um, a, a parcellation structure, for example, in fMRI, where we're focused on a single area such as dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or temporal parietal junction um, in thinking about theories of consciousness. But there's another way that we can look at this map. We can look at the topology. So instead of just very crisply getting from one state to another, one brain area to another, we could think about the topology of the Rocky Mountains and how they change more on a continuum. Um, and that is exactly um, what was done in this study, generating a functional connectome and looking at a, a gradient of functional connectivity states rather than a, a, a strict, discrete, a parcellation system. And what we posited and what I believe we demonstrated is that there are cortical gradients in the brain that seem to map onto key dimensions of consciousness such as awareness, arousability, which we talked about, and also sensory organization. And what we did was to create a neurofunctional framework for states of consciousness based on those cortical gradients that are depicted here. And you can see how they change in ways that are consistent with what we would expect. So for propofol deep sedation, you are reducing awareness, but you still have arousability. And that's what would make it sedation, is that you can arouse somebody back to a state of consciousness, whereas propofol general anesthesia disrupts both. Ketamine anesthesia, for example, which, as I said before, ketamine activates arousal-promoting regions. You get high-frequency activity. Um, there are hallucinations or dream states during ketamine anesthesia, but presumably a lack of um, representation of the external world. And that was found to be consistent with uh, a disrupted cortical gradient that mediated sensory organization. So we look forward to moving forward with this. And I think there, there are two important implications. One, perhaps instead of just having this heuristic uh, 
conceptual framework related to dimensions of consciousness, we can actually have a, a measurable neurobiological framework. But al also importantly, uh, thinking about continua and gradients might get us away from uh, a strict um, parcellation schema or localization schema for the neural correlates of consciousness and something that's more distributed and nuanced. So for my overall summary, I'll say that there's evidence that recurrent processing, feedback processing from prefrontal cortex to posterior cortex is important for consciousness and anesthetic-induced unconsciousness. That the PFC is a node in arousal circuitry that regulates the level of consciousness. And finally, as a, a future direction, that focusing on gradients might be beneficial for identifying dimensions and neural correlates of consciousness. I want to thank our funding sources from the National Institutes of Health. I want to acknowledge all of my colleagues at the Center for Consciousness Science. This is from a few years ago, and I've already um, uh, highlighted a number of people. There are many other colleagues who um, aren't on this slide. Uh, also, um, our graduate students, uh, a number of uh, my students have uh, recently graduated, moved on to postdocs or other positions, um, but it's been a, a real pleasure working with them. And finally, I would like to thank you uh, for your kind attention. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person with you to have what I'm sure would be a robust discussion, um, but I look forward to interacting with you in some other form, and I hope that you have a wonderful conference. Thank you so very much.